we make policy based on our conditions, not somebody else's. But we're not an island. Uh, we're going to feel these. We are feeling these international things. But it so happens, two things: we're we're getting a rebound in housing and good, solid job growth and consumption spending at the same time. And so there's a bit of an offset right there. And so in aggregate, things are still okay. Uh, but on top of that, uh, inflation's at two percent. So if, if inflation were below 2%, like significantly, then, uh, then you'd see every downside risk more importantly than upside risks, which is where we were, like say, in 2015. But here we can be much more symmetric about it. You noted in, the, in your report today that there are these risks that remain, right? The trade file remains with huge uncertainties. We've seen the effect that's had on business. Yeah. You think the back half will show some of this weakness. Yeah. It ra raises the question of why not just do the insurance cut? Why not get in front of all of that? What's the cost of such a cut? Well, uh, another part of our local uh, situation is we might have much higher financial vulnerabilities, say, than the U.S. And uh, although we've got macroprudential measures in place to keep them, we think, in check, mm -hmm. uh, especially the stress test on mortgages, it uh, doesn't mean that we can't reignite imbalances in housing markets, you know, by being, uh, uh, be, by being aggressive. And so I think here, again, we're weighing those outside risks that are outside the inflation forecast part uh, and saying, you know, let's at least put due consideration to those things. And there is a cost to that insurance. You're going to add to those financial vulnerabilities on the premise that maybe those risks are going to have another negative effect on you. Don't forget, Canada has been exposed to the trade war since Trump was elected. Okay, we were first. So right. a lot of that down, downside in investment is already in our, our decision making, in our numbers. What are the biggest risks to your outlook when you look? I mean, uncertainty obviously is the name of the game, so you can't really know. But yeah. what do you worry about? Well, I worry most about an escalation in the trade war. Um, and in the, or it doesn't even have to escalate if it just continues in this haphazard fashion that one day it's this, one day it's that, then how do you decide, as a real business person, you know, trying to decide to invest, spend real money, how do you make those kinds of decisions mm -hmm. in that? So people have kind of frozen up. And uh, that can have pretty big consequences elsewhere in the world now, and it's all showing up. And the next step would be commodity prices go on a bigger slide because world growth is down again. And so that all accumulates, and then we're looking at kind of like 2015, right? Uh, so that, that is, I think, our, our biggest concern. Lots of other little ones, but without that one, we wouldn't be really that worried. And, of course, that is driving other banks, especially the Federal Reserve, right? We expect the Fed to move again um, and stay wary, stay on the dovish side of the spectrum. Yeah. Do we do you worry, and how do you, I guess, how do you measure whether central banks have lost their ability to control what they once controlled? The recent repo market um, kind of instability, one issue, but more broadly, are we at the end of the, the, the line for what you can do with rate cuts? Uh, yeah, well, on, on, uh, setting aside the technical issues of the money market, I, I think those, that's all they are. But I think uh, in terms of the effectiveness of monetary policy, it's obvious that you know, none of us has a lot of room to maneuver, and some, some central banks have literally none left. Uh, but we do have uh, uh, you know, unconventional tools that have been shown to have, have extra so second-order uh, implications for the economy. So those things are there. But, but the other side of it is that everybody understands that this is exactly the situation Keynes was writing about in 1936. This is when fiscal policy is most powerful and, and monetary policy is least powerful. Well, we've known that for a really long time. This is not a revelation. Um, and so, fortunately, you know, here in Canada, we had some fiscal support, like, over the last four years. That, that support, uh, as I wrote in a speech, or gave it a speech in uh, February, uh, saved us around 100 basis points of further monetary easing. That's pretty significant, because you would have been doing that in the middle of a hot housing market, bidding wars, and all those kinds of things. Uh, the fact that we were able to avoid that is, is a positive. So the mix matters in all states of the world, uh, and especially this one. Therefore, when we do expect more fiscal support coming, uh, certainly that every election plan, uh, every party's plan included kind of spending, do, will we get what we need? How do you measure w whether those plans will be enough? If you were to add fiscal stimulus on the order in Canada, $5 billion, let's say, uh, well, that's worth on the order of a quarter quarter of a point. Uh, it does have about the same macroeconomic effect as a quarter point insurance cut. 
you see. And, but with a couple of other aspects that matter, if you are using fiscal policy, you actually reduce fiscal vulnerabilities because you raise the denominator of those ratios without people taking on more debt. Uh, as opposed to when you use interest rates to, as a cutting mechanism, you're act actively adding the financial vulnerabilities, encouraging individuals to do the borrowing and the spending right. instead of the government. 